Take your Bibles and let's go to Matthew 25. Now, um, how many of you have got the Articles of Faith? Okay, well, if you don't have a copy of the Articles of Faith, there's a big stack back there. We made a bunch of copies. It would behoove you to get a copy of the Articles of Faith of your local church so you know what we believe. Um, and this is why we're taking time to do these messages and record uh, these things so that you can have something to refer back to. Um, the Articles of Faith are not the Bible, okay? So I want you to think, well, we're, we're teaching, <laughs> you know, that this is infallible. But what the Articles of Faith are designed to do is to give you an outline of some of the basic things that we as born-again, Bible-believing, King James-only believers are supposed to believe. And especially this local church. You need to know what your local church believes. I am amazed at how many people go to churches and when you sit down and have a conversation with them, they have no clue what their church believes. They don't know anything about their doctrines. They don't know anything about their history. They know nothing about what the pastor believes. They don't know what the history of their uh, articles of faith are. They don't even know if they have an articles of faith. Now, most churches, especially established churches, have some form of articles of faith. I've seen some that were as thick as ours. I've seen some that were just one page long. But um, most churches have an outline of the basic things that they believe. You need to delve into what this church believes, if you're a member here especially, so that when people ask you, well, what does your church believe? What does it mean to be King James Bible Church? You know, what, what is the tenets of your belief? What do you guys believe about the rapture? You know, what do you guys believe about uh, the Lord's Supper? Uh, what do you believe about, you know, A, B, and C? And I've tried, when I put this Articles of Faith together, to cover everything that I feel like you're going to get hit with somewhere along the way, especially controversial issues that you need to know, have a Bible answer for. And these articles of faith, um, if you look at them, they are loaded with Scripture. Okay, I don't just write out the articles. This is what our church believes, you know, and not give you any source material to go to in your Bible to look it up. That's why we're taking time to do what we're doing. Tonight we're on a continuation of the Day of the Lord. Now, we finished up last time we were together in Matthew 24. Now we're in Matthew 25. So let's start with Matthew 25. And we need to look at some things here. <clears throat> Verse 25. The Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of what? Now, we've, we've done a lot of preaching on the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and the difference, right? So I don't really need to go in detail about that tonight, but I do need to give you some basic stuff here about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Yes, sir? Matthew 25, verse 1. Yeah. Yeah, you said verse 25. Did I say? Chapter 25, verse 1. All right, so we're all on the same page. Now, that word then there that starts out in that verse lets you know that this is preceding something that happened before it. In other words, what you read in 51 of chapter 24 happens first, and then this is going to happen in chapter 25. Hence, the King James translators uh, section this off as chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, that's an earthly, Jewish, physical kingdom, Okay? All right. It shall be likened unto what? Ten what? Virgins. Does that say virgins plural or does that say virgin singular? Plural. That's going to be very important when we go into this study. Because you got churches that teach that these virgins are the church. And the five wise are those that uh, get saved and stay saved. And the five foolish are those that got saved and lost their salvation. I've heard it preached like that many, many times by many different types of preachers, and they're all wrong. These virgins have nothing to do with the body of Christ, the church, and there's not the church in it. There's no church in chapter 25. The Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. All right? Five of them were wise. And five were foolish. 
They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Everybody went to sleep. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sail and do what? Now let me ask you something. You're in the body of Christ. You're in the church age. You're a born again believer. Can you buy the Holy Ghost? No. Well, they just don't fit you then, does it? Because this group here was told to buy it. You know what a man in the book of Acts tried to do? He tried to buy the Holy Ghost. He tried to buy the power that they had where they were laying hands on people. And he saw a sign and saw that they, uh, by laying on the hands, they, they were getting the Holy Ghost. He said, uh, let me give you some money and let me buy this power so that whomsoever I lay hands on, they can also receive the Holy Ghost. He thought the gift of God could be bought with money. But it can't be bought with money in this dispensation. But there's a dispensation coming up where some things have to be bought. And you're not going to buy it with money. Okay? You're going to buy it with your works. Your works is what's going to count. Okay? All right, the Bible says here, buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of what? Not the Son of God. So why is that important, preacher? Because the Son of God is who the church is looking for. The Son of Man is who Israel is looking for. Different group. Same person. Different titles. Because when he's operating, watch this. I am a husband, I am a father, and I am a son. Now to my wife, I'm a husband. She looks to me as a husband. Okay? My son does not look at me as a husband. My son looks at me as a father. I'm the same person in both cases. But my role to her is a husband. My role to my son is a father. And with Jesus Christ, when he shows up at the rapture, he's showing up to Jew, uh, to Christians as the Son of God, and he's coming back to get you, to bring you to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, and you're looking for him as such. When he shows up to Israel at the end of the tribulation period, he's showing up as the Son of Man. Why? Because that's a Jewish term. See given to Israel. Let me give you some verses now. I've, I've, I've said a lot here, so let's go back and let's look at some things here. Let's look at that Son of Man first. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3. Was, Is, was Ezekiel Jewish? Anybody know? <laughs> Ezekiel? He's written in the Old Testament, right? Alright, he's written to Israel, right? Alright, go over here to Ezekiel chapter 3 and look down here. Um, chapter 3 verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. Verse 17. Now look at that. What's the first three words in that verse say? And who is he talking to there when he says that? He's talking to Ezekiel. He calls him son of man. And what does he say to him? Look at it. 
I have made thee a watchman unto who? See the connection there? Son of man is a watchman to the house of who? Israel. So that term becomes ingrained in Jewish mindset to refer to something of a Jewish nature. So when we see Jesus showing up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and he's referred to as the Son of Man, he is in connection to Israel in those verses. has nothing to do with the church. As a matter of fact, when you look at Matthew 24 and 25, you don't see the church in either one of those chapters. There's no rapture in chapter 24. There's no rapture in chapter 25. It's all Jewish in nature. Why? Because Jesus ain't going to the cross yet. When he's talking about these things, he's talking to a Jewish audience. Who was the rapture revealed to? Paul. Paul's the first one to receive the mystery of the rapture. He says, behold, i show you a mystery. Remember that verse? Let's look at it. Anybody know where it's at? All right, go to First Thessalonians. <clears throat> Brother, when you find it, read it. When Paul says that, he's saying, I'm showing you something you didn't know before. It won't reveal to Peter. It won't reveal to uh, the other apostles. It was revealed to Paul first. Now the other apostles may have picked up on it, like John, like Brother Jack was talking about. But John's not the first one to get that mystery. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Revelation, the rapture is really not what that book's about. That book is about the tribulation period and Israel being restored and the church being married to Jesus Christ and being here on earth reigning with Him a thousand years. You found it? Hold on just a minute. I'll help you find it. It's going to be... I'm going to assess if I can't find the mystery part. Yep. Uh, let's see. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.51. 1 Corinthians 15.51 uh, it, it was the wrong one. 1 Corinthians 15.51 1 Corinthians 15.51 Everybody say amen when you get it. Alright. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a what? Something they didn't know before he speaks these words. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For well, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. That's the first revelation of the rapture to the church right there. He says, I'll show you a mystery. Okay? Now, getting back to Matthew 25. A couple of things I need to point out to you. That son of man, like I said, that's important. Now let's go back to verse 1. Let's look at this thing on the virgins. Virgins, plural. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get my verses here. Alright. These five wise virgins were looking for the Lord. Let me get my verses here. Hold on just a minute. Alright. Now in Matthew 25, when the bridegroom is coming, the church has already gotten married to Jesus Christ. 
All right, we'll look at that verse in a minute. It's going to be Luke twelve thirty six. So go ahead and find that, um, but keep your place here. The church is referred to as plural, as uh, is never referred to rather as plural virgins, but rather as a single virgin. That's the first thing we need to notice. All right, so let's look at some verses on that. Go to Second Corinthians. This is comparing scripture with scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now we're going to be flipping back and forth to Matthew 25, so you need to keep your place there because I'm over, we're going to go right back over there in just a second. 11, 11 verse 2. Second Corinthians 11, verse 2. Paul says here, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste what? Is that plural or singular? So that virgin there is different than the ones you read in Matthew 25. The ones you read about in Matthew 25 are plural. So it's not the same group of people. The church is never referred to as virgins plural. The church is referred to as a virgin singular. This group here in Matthew 25 is referred to in the plural. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 and you'll see him say it again. Something similar. Ephesians 4. The Bible says in verse 4, there is what? All right, that's a singular, right? And one what? Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So when God is referring to the church, he's always referring to the church as one. One single unit. But there's another group of people that we're dealing with in Matthew 25 that is plural. Okay? God deals with them differently, so he refers to them differently. Now, who are these virgins? Go over here to Psalm 45. Let's look at these verses. Psalm 45. And we'll start figuring out who they are in just a second here. Psalm 45. And look at verse 14. Psalm 45, verse 14. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her what? You know what these virgins are in Matthew 25? They're companions to the body of Christ. They're not in the body of Christ, but they're companions. All right, look at verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. That's you. That's a, pref that's a reference to the church. You, in the eyes of Jesus Christ, are gold within on the inside because you have the nature of Jesus Christ on the inside of you. You're born again. You've got the Spirit of God on the inside of you. You're a new creature, and you're recreated in the image of Jesus Christ. And I've showed you several verses in this study up to this point where Jesus is referred to as a golden being. Okay? All right. The Bible says here in verse 14, She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework, the virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall thy uh, instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Take your Bible and go to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Now, in type, the book of the Song of Solomon is a love story between Christ and the church. And in this descriptive love story... You're going to read where he gives descriptors of her and then she gives descriptors of him. And in the midst of this, there's going to be people that show up 
that are companions. Look at verse 3. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins, that's plural, love thee. Look down here at uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Look at verse 4, rather. Go back up to verse 4. Let's get the context. Here the bridegroom praises the bride. Thou art beautiful. This is the Lord talking about the church. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirza, coming as Jerusalem, comely as Jerusalem, rather, terrible as in what? You're going to see that in Revelation 19, 14, with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are three score, that's sixty, queens, and four score, that's eighty, concubines, and virgins. There they are again, without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but what? She's one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters, plural, saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? That's the church. That's Jesus Christ. That's what he thinks about you and your glorified state. All right, go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Here, Jesus is described as returning from the wedding. He's returning from the wedding. Look at Luke 12, verse 35. Let your loins be girt about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves liken the men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. See that thing? Who's he talking to there? He's talking to Jews. He's not talking to the church. Are you waiting for him to return from the wedding? Well, if, he's, if you're waiting for him to return to the wedding, you're late to the party. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to be getting married to him. I mean, what are you doing waiting for the wedding? That's like the bridegroom sitting around saying, uh, telling the bride, uh, just wait till I get back from the wedding, sweetheart, and I'll come to get you. No, that ain't you. That's a different group. The Bible says, and you yourselves like in the men that wait for their Lord when he, sh he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. That's churches in the tribulation period, plural. What did Jesus say in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in uh, Revelation 3? To Luke, uh, the lukewarm church, Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Does he have to knock to get inside where you are? If he does, you're not saved. Think about it. Is Jesus Christ dwelling in your hearts by faith? Then that ain't the group he's talking about, buddy. See how we got our theology messed up with these verses? That's preached a lot. Now, I've heard it in soul winning message, and it'll preach in soul winning. I preach it a lot with soul winning, you know, telling people, look, if you're lost, he's standing at your door, he's knocking, he wants to come inside. I would never tell a Christian that. He's already inside with the door shut and sealed. <laughs> you ain't got to worry about him being on the outside knocking to get in. He's inside. And here, he kind of gives an, uh, a reference to that. And when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those what? Servants. These virgins are servants. All right. The Bible says here, uh, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find what? Watching. 
Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Now notice that part there about the watching. The watching. Because when you go to the book of Hebrews, there's something in there that's very interesting that's said. And the book of Hebrews is aimed at who? Jews. The Jews. Are you Hebrew? <laughs> and it's not written to you. It's written to the Hebrews. All right, so when he's writing to the Hebrews, he says something to them. Let's go to look at it real quick. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. That's one place we want to look at. And let me get my verses here. Hold on a minute. One of them is in Hebrews 9. I know it's there. Let's see. Hebrews 9.28. See that in verse uh, 28? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, that's the watching, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, there's another one where he says, without holiness... Follow peace with all men. Um, without holiness, no man shall what? That's in Hebrews chapter 12. Look at twelve fourteen. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, when you get over there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll notice a peculiar thing Jesus is saying to the disciples. He keeps telling them, watch, watch. Watch, watch, watch. See? And in Hebrews, he says, look. And, and if, you, if you're not in a state of holiness, you won't see him. That's an appearance that Jesus Christ makes in the tribulation period to those Jews that have to endure to the end to be saved. Remember in Matthew 24 where Jesus said, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. That's not you. You can't. You don't have to endure to the end to be saved. You get saved the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ. So it's a different group of people. So that group that has to endure to the end has to watch for something. He's going to make an appearance right before the second advent and those that are watching are going to go up with him. It's a post-tribulation rapture there for the nation of Israel that are watching for him. See? <clears throat> All right. We'll get back to that a little bit more later. All right. These virgins are men, they're Jewish, and they're servants. Go to Matthew 24, 45. Matthew 24. And look at verse 35. No, not 35. I'm sorry. 45. Well, let's go back at, um, let's go over here to verse 42. Start there. Let's start there. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch, the what? Keep that in mind. We're going to look at that in a minute. The thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his what? House to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise what? Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so what? That's works. All right. Go to Revelation. Hold your place there. Go to Revelation chapter 16. That thief, we need to identify who that is. The good man of the house winds up being Satan. The thief winds up being Jesus Christ. <laughs> chapter 16. And look at verse... 15. 
Behold, who's talking there? I come as a what? A what? Alright. Blessed is he that does what? There it is again. See the connection? And keepeth his garments. That's works. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Let me ask you something. Do you have to keep your garments? Nope. You know what my garments are? My garments are, I threw my garments away a long time ago when I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ and gave him my heart and I put on the garments of Jesus Christ and he keeps those garments. Different group. And this group here has to watch. And Jesus says, I'm going to come as a thief. For those that are watching, I'm going to take them. And those that ain't watching are going to be left behind. Look over here at the next part here. Go back to Matthew 24 again. See that faithful and wise servant? Go to Isaiah 41. You make spiritual application all this. I don't have a problem in the world with that. and I've, I've done it myself. But don't you get rid of the doctrinal application. I'm giving you the doctrinal application on these things tonight. I'm showing you these things don't belong to the body of Christ. These things are aimed at Israel. Alright. Isaiah 41, eight. Look at verse 8 there. The Bible says, But thou Israel... Read that next part. Art my servant. Art my what? Servant. You know how many times he says that in the Old Testament? <laughs> Over and over and over again, especially in Isaiah. Israel is God's servant. And Israel is the one being referred to in Matthew 24 when he says, a wise and faithful servant. He's aiming it at them. And he distinguishes between the wise servant and the unwise servant. Okay, because it's a works-based situation, and the wise servant's going to be saved, and the unwise servant's not. And the household is the household that Jesus Christ establishes, which is his house, according to Hebrews chapter 3, I believe it is, where Jesus is, a, um, is over his own house. All right, but now listen to me. What are you? You're the temple of the Lord, right? You're the body of Jesus Christ. You're a different entity than them. Alright, look at Leviticus chapter 25. See that meat there? Leviticus 25. You know who the oracles of God were given to? Exactly. Look at Leviticus 25, verse 55. For unto me the children of Israel are what? Servants. They are my what? Servants. He says it twice in the same verse. Because some blockhead can't get it through their head that that's who that is. I mean, whom I brought forth of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. That's what he identifies Israel as over and over and over again. Israel my servant. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Back to Matthew 25. These virgins. Now, God will specifically mention these virgins in Revelation chapter 14. We'll find out exactly who they are in Matthew, excuse me, not Matthew, Revelation. It's been a long day. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, verse 1. I'm going to go down to verse 4. The Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount what? And I don't mean Mount Rushmore. 
And with him, 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. Watch it. What's that next part say? There they are. There's Matthew 25. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Go to Revelation chapter 7. And look at verse 4. Just in case you're wondering who this 144,000 is, if you ask a Jehovah's Witness, they'll say they're the 144,000. There's a problem. When you get to Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, you run into an issue. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of who? Israel. <laughs> okay. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. See that thing? Those twelve, those each one of them are from a tribe in Israel. And I, I had a Jehovah's Witness I was uh, dealing with one time, and and they were trying to tell me that that's a reference to the Jehovah's Witnesses that were faithful to the end. And I said, Well, let me ask you something. I said, Are you one of the hundred forty-four thousand? Yes, I am. I said, Well, which tribe are you in? <laughs> and they couldn't answer me. He saw I was busy and he had to go. <laughs> I mean, that's their standard on a line when, they, when they're cornered like that. They don't know what to say. Uh, you can get these guys real good when you ask them that question. Which tribe are you from? Same thing with the Mormons running around doing the same stuff. Ask them what tribe is it that they're in. They can't tell you. All right. Now, go to Revelation 12. These are thoroughbred Jews, my friend. Revelation twelve seventeen. The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. That's the law. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's the grace of God under the New Testament. You know what that says? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and works is how you get saved in the tribulation period. You've got to have both. And if you don't have both, you're going to be dying and going straight to hell. And you don't get your salvation until the end of that thing. Thank God I'm in the church age. Thank God I'm saved under grace. <laughs> Amen. And I ain't got to worry about that. I'm riding on the coattails of Jesus Christ. Trust me. All right. Now, let's go a little further here. The Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like... And we're back in Matthew 25, verse 1 now. And it be like unto the virgins which took their lamps. We know who those virgins are now. And went forth to meet the bridegroom. And went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay? Now, so he's coming back from the wedding. Now, in the tribulation period, five of them are going to be wise and five are going to be foolish. They which foolish take lamps and took no oil with them. So it's possible in the kingdom of heaven to be operating without the Holy Ghost. That means there's people in the kingdom of heaven that are both saved and lost. Now, let me say that again. It is possible to be in the kingdom of heaven and have people that are saved in it and people that are lost in it. But that is not possible in the kingdom of God. 
Only saved, blood-bought, blood-washed children of God that are born again can be in the kingdom of God. Period. No unsaved people are in the kingdom of God. But there can be both in the kingdom of heaven. And I've showed y'all that before in the past. All right. Now, notice what he says next there. He says, the five took, uh, They that were foolish took their lamps and had no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So there's, there's, there's uh, probably the evangelist and the preachers or the two witnesses, possibly, that are there that's laying hands on people and giving them the Holy Ghost. So you're back in Acts, where the apostles were laying hands on people and they were receiving the Holy Ghost. See? And that's why he says, go to them. And there is also the thing about the apostles being brought back in the tribulation period. And some of your Old Testament prophets may come back in the Old Testament uh, in the tribulation period. All right. The Bible says here, as they're going, he says, but the wise answered that. All right. Verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, you got to be ready. Uh, went, in, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. After we came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, go to First Timothy. I was watching a debate on YouTube today between some guys about... A man, if he's saved, he, he'll lose his salvation if he sins, and and the Lord will deny him. There's a big problem with that. Um, let me see if I can get my verse here right. Hold on just a minute. Uh, hold on just a minute. I'm going to look it up here. It may be Second Timothy. Let me get my verse here. I get these things in my head, but I don't get the numbers right. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. There we are. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 11. The Bible says it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also do what? Alright? In other words, if you're crucified with Christ and you've received spirit baptism, that means Jesus Christ has come into your heart and saved you and the Holy Ghost has placed you in the body of Christ. You're dead with Christ. Alright? The Bible says you will live with Him. Then, there's another group here in verse 12 that He addresses. That's people that are already saved. Watch what happens to that group that's already saved and then you'll get confused. If we suffer, that's a different situation. A lot of Christians ain't willing to suffer for the Lord. So what happens? They ain't going to reign with Him. See? See the verse? If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, some Christians do, He also will deny us. But what's He going to deny us? He's not going to deny us our salvation. He's going to deny us a reign with Him. You'll be in the kingdom of God, but you won't reign. How do I know that? Because of what the next verse says. If we believe not, yet He abideth faithful, He can not deny Himself. In other words, if you're in Jesus Christ, He cannot deny you as being His. But He can deny you a reign with Him. It's kind of like a situation if you got children and a child becomes disobedient. You're never going to deny that that child belongs to you. That child's yours. I mean, you can't deny that. I mean, their DNA is flowing. Your DNA is flowing in their body. But... 
You can take away privileges from them. You can deny them privileges. You can deny them things that you want to do with them that you can't do with them because they're disobedient. And that's the context of this. This group over here in Matthew chapter 25 is a different group because he says to that group, I know you not. He does not say in that verse, I never knew you. It's a group that started out right and they wound up wrong at the end. Now this is where you guys that believe you can lose your salvation, they run on these verses, but they get them out of their context. And I'm teaching you guys the proper way to understand these verses so when they come to you with these verses, you'll know exactly how to explain it to them. Okay? Because they're going to run to you with these verses. They're going to say, well, see, Jesus said he would, he would deny you. No, he said, I know you not. And that's a group of people in the tribulation period that have to endure to the end to be saved. And they started out right, but they ended up wrong. No, no, you're exactly right, brother. Amen. But it's good for you to know. <laughs> Sound doctrine, right? Sound doctrine and rightly divided. All right, go back over here <clears throat> and let's look at the next thing. All right, look at verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein your Lord cometh. All right, look at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto him his goods. And unto one he gave five what? Talents. I think we talked about this before. Talents. You know what that is? That's a Jewish measurement. I'm going to show you something in a minute and it's going to blow your mind. If i got time, let's see what time it is. Yeah, we should have time. All right, let's read through this part here real quick because I want to get down to where next week we get to the judgment of the nations. All right, the Bible says he gave him talents, five talents, to another two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received the two, he also gained the other two. But he that received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. <clears throat> After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful what? Notice he keeps on saying servants there. Good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The condition for them entering in is that they took the talent that God gave them and increased them. So it's a works-based situation. He also that had received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he, he that had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, there thou hast, that is thine. Now look at what happens. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with ushery. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him that hath ten talents. For unto every one that, shall, that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that that he hath. And look at what happens in verse 30. What happens in verse 30? To that servant. He starts out right though, right? God gave him talents at the beginning, didn't he? Would God give that to a lost man? He would not give that to a lost man. He would give that to a saved man. Or a man that's in good standing with him, right? He trusted him with his money at the beginning of the thing. 
But the servant wound up screwing up, messing up, and hid the money, and God took him at the end of the day and cast him somewhere. Where did he cast him? And I don't mean purgatory. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's look at another story that's very similar. Go to Luke chapter 19. This is where this thing becomes tricky in your Bible when you're reading these stories and hearing these parables. Because sometimes Jesus is talking to one group in one parable, and you'll go and read another parable that's similar to that parable, but there's word differences because he's talking to a different group of people. And I'm going to give you an example of this right here. Luke chapter 15, uh, 19. Luke chapter 19. Alright. Go to Luke chapter 19 and look at verse 11. I'm going to read it kind of quick so I can give you the commentary on it. As they heard these things, he added and said, and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of what? God should appear, should immediately appear. And he said, therefore, a certain what? Nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a what? Ah, different little scenario there. And to return, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten what? What does that say? Pounds? Does it say pounds? You know what a pound is? That's an English measurement. What is that sitting in the King James Bible before? <laughs> What's Jesus talking about an English measurement when he's talking to a bunch of people there? He's giving you a different group of people he's getting ready to talk to. And you're going to see the different outcome at the end. Watch this. The Bible says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy. Ah, there's a difference there too, right? You're told to occupy till he comes. That's the command to the church. But his citizens, that's the Jews, hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. You know what the Jews said at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? They said, we have no king but Caesar. We don't want this man over us. We'll take you. See, we'll take you. We'll take Caesar over Jesus. God said, okay, I'll give you Caesar. And he gave him Caesar for the last 2,000 years and he had beat him to a pulp. Inquisition, you know what it was run up by? Roman Catholic Church, Caesar, Rome. You know what Adolf Hitler was? He was a Roman Catholic. Jewish Holocaust. We'll have Caesar. God said, I'll give him to you. <laughs> Came to pass, verse 15, that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first said, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou what? Authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he, and he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound which I have kept, laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an astute man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I what? Judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an astute man, taking up I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore, then gave not thou my money into the bank, at my coming, I might have required mine own with ush ushery, rather. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. What happened to the servant? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he just had taken away from him what he had. That's what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ for a lot of Christians. They're going to lose their shirt, but they're going to be saved themselves. I'll show it to you in a minute. 
because it matches what you're reading here. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken away from him. But look at verse 27. But those my enemies, plural, that goes back to verse 14. That's the enemies. Which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, and slay them before me. Boy, he's going to have a slaughter in the tribulation period. He's going to windle those Jews down to about 2,000 people. <laughs> because they would not have Jesus Christ reign over them. You talk to that Jew right now in Israel, and they hate Jesus Christ. They don't want anything to do with Jesus as a whole. You'll find a Jew here and there, or somebody with Jewish blood like myself that might receive Christ, but you're not going to have a thoroughbred Jew as a massive group of people converting to Jesus Christ in the church age, but they'll convert in the tribulation period. That's a story. That's a study for another time. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. I'm going to show you about this salvation thing. How it works out at the judgment seat of Christ, which matches what you're reading there in Luke chapter 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's go down here at verse 12. Well, let's look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You've got to get your foundation right, so you've got to have Christ. All right? Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, that's the day of the Lord, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now that's very important that you notice the wording there. It's not about how much and how many and the uh, quantity, if you will, of what you're doing for God. It's the quality of what you're doing for God that matters. It matters because of what your heart's doing with it. When you serve God, what are you serving Him for? Are you serving Him to get a pat on the back? Are you serving Him to get some attention? Are you serving Him just so people can pat you on the back and say, what a great Christian that is? I know some Christians right now that they get on Facebook, man, and they just love, they just love the attention. That's what they're there for. That's what Facebook's about anyway. All right? But when you do something for Jesus Christ, hear me out real carefully now. You need to do it just because you love Him. And that narrows it down, don't it? That's the sort. And that's what God's looking for. Quality, not quantity. Alright, look at verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? A reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Take that pound from him. <laughs> but he himself shall be what? Save. Save. Yet so is my fire. He's going to get his shirt tail burned off. Because why? Our God's a consuming fire. I get busy doing something. I get busy in church and do and, and do like y'all were doing here on a Wednesday night and and learning as much of the Word of God as you can and praying and witnessing as much as you can, passing out tracts where you can. But you're doing it because why? Love the Lord. You love the Lord, not because you can get a little reward on Sunday morning in church. Get your name on the roster or something. No, we do what we need to do for the Lord because we love Him and we want to do what He requires of us because we want to stay in His will. Amen. That's what this verses, these verses here in Luke chapter 19 are. And you see the difference there, right? Between Matthew 25, which is aimed at Israel, and Luke chapter 19, which is you and I. We're under the pounds, they're under the talents. In one situation, they lose their soul. In the other situation, we just lose our, our, our pounds. 
Okay? But we're still saved. Now, next week, we're going to be Matthew 25, and we'll start in verse 31. And we'll see what happens at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus Christ shows up with the church and sets up shop and judges the nations. When He judges the nations, He's going to judge them according to His words and He is going to separate them like sheep from goats. And He's going to separate the people out of those nations. And then He's going to judge them and there's a condition on how they enter into the millennial kingdom. And it's not, listen to me, it's not Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. The condition for getting into the kingdom, the millennial kingdom that He's going to deal with these nations on at the end of the tribulation going into the millennium is what did you do with these, my brethren? (laughs) Did you feed them? Hello, Mother Teresa. Did you, I mean, that's where she gets it from. She just got the right thing uh, and the wrong dispensation. See, those Catholics over there, they, they practice Matthew 25 to a T. They're out there feeding the poor. They're out there trying to get people, you know, fed and clothed. They're, 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 they're meticulous about that. Because they've read these verses and they think that if they're doing that in the church age, they're doing it to Jesus. Wrong. You're just feeding a bunch of poor people. (laughs) But, when you get to this part here that we're going to be looking at next week, you're doing it to Jesus. And that's a condition for you getting into the kingdom. Interesting, ain't it? Alright, anybody got any questions on what we went over tonight? Did you learn anything? I tried to be as thorough as I could possibly be on it, so I might have missed a few things. But um, you see the picture here, what we're talking about. All right. Well, let's close in prayer. Brother Earl, close us in prayer tonight. Father, for today. Thank you, the Word, Lord. Uh, Father, we just thank you for that mark and the anointing you had on tonight, Lord. Your Word, Lord, and I pray that we take this to heart, we take it back, we study it, we. We grow from it, we mature from the Lord, uh, until we meet again, Lord. We just bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now.